Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, September 12, 2015. Welcome to our Bible study, which will be moderated by Tom today. Tom, go ahead. Well, good morning. Um, so I'm looking forward to a great discussion, so I hope you all are too. Um, so we'll start out with a uh, quote from Mary Baker Eddy from uh, No and Yes. If the Bible and science and health had the place in schools of learning that physiology occupies, they would revolutionize and reform the world through the power of Christ. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Uh, today, uh, um, uh, we're going to be discussing the parable, The Rich Fool. Okay, so um, um, if you get any indication of um, uh, where this is going, the topic, instead of being the rich fool, is rich towards God, okay? Um, there you go. So um, the, uh, the first question is, um, uh, what is abundance? Plenty. And... Overflowing kind of plenty. Mm -hmm. Well, anybody else? <laughs> so if it's overflowing, yeah, it yeah. sounds like it's something that comes from an infinite source. Amen. Yes, I like that uh, definition. It's the 1828 said the same: an overflowing quantity, great plenty. Yeah, I, I, I thought of it as having a lot of that which is real and of which the universe is made out of, which is life, truth, and love. Webster also said an abundance of the heart. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, it could be abundance of the heart or, uh, you know, uh, or, or uh, plenty of fish was one of the other examples. You know, um, so abundance almost seems to be agnostic, you know, um, like someone said, it means, uh, you know, Webster said great plenty. And what is plenty? I looked that up. I thought it was interesting. It said uh, ample supply of human wants, everything we human we need. I was thinking along the terms of abundance as being what kind of abundance? Is it the physical supply or, you know, joy, love, gratitude? What kind of abundance makes me the happiest? Well, it's certainly not just having lots of fish. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other kind. It's the joy and the gratitude and, and the love that makes one happiest. That makes me think of another term that was in Webster's was ample sufficiency, and we're told that our sufficiency is of God. As my grace is sufficient for thee. I, I like the thought that Bruce said, if it's abundant, then the source must be God, overflowing. And in the story of the prodigal son, and I, I often think of this, if you ever feel lack, uh, where the father tells the son, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. The truth for each one of his children, an abundant source of good. And I, I think also, you know, the, the thought of maybe excess being here could come in, but then uh, I thought there, there are no excesses in love. In, in, in other words, it has to be all balanced. So your rich overflow should be going to somewhere to bless someone, keeping it all in perfect balance as God wants it. Thank you. That's, that's one of the biblical rules of finance. Once you have more than what you need, you give. And even before you do, because when you do it before you do, you'll end up having the abundance because it's obedience to God. The biblical rule of finance to give to others, those in need, 
throughout the Bible and throughout science and health. Well, it's a good question to ask where our trust is. Is our trust in the infinite source, or are we enamored by its effect and placing a false trust in it? Yeah, one way to picture that false trust is, uh, you know, uh, someone mentioned the abundance of heart and then also the uh, abundance of fish. But, you know, if you have abundance of heart, uh, you know, um, think about where you'll be in a few days. You still have abundance of heart. But if you have abundance of fish, you know, that is uh, too much fish, uh, where is it going to be in a few days, you know? Well, but if you have too much fish and you're giving and really blessing others, the abundance of heart is sustained. Yes, and the other is uh, life is going to start stinking, you know? <laughs> you really smell like That's exactly true. It stagnates and stinks. Yes. That's right. right. Very bad. But I thought this is a verse from Proverbs <laughs> I never seen before or thought about. It's Proverbs 38 and 9. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of the Lord in vain. So, that's a, a good thought, to the right sense of it. Is. So what's the remedy if you don't, if you feel like you don't have enough of something? Start with gratitude? Well, I think we're going to get to that. So I yeah, think we're, we're going to talk about that. abundance, yeah. and we'll be getting to that, okay? So our next, so if that's okay, we'll go on to the next question. Um, so innumerable multitudes of people came to hear Jesus, so many that they trod upon each other. And one of these people asked Jesus to talk with his brother to divide an inheritance. So what do we think about that? Was this because there was uh, a lack of fairness here? It doesn't so, so matter. The, go ahead. Why don't you someone just start out and say, how did Jesus respond to that question? <laughs> yeah, if, not the parable, but what, what is his immediate response? He, you want to just say he, what that was? He um, rebuked them because they asked the wrong question. They didn't realize he was. They were asking as a teacher and a judge, and he didn't like it. So he said he wouldn't judge them. Who am I to uh, be the divider? And then he went on um, right. to tell you know the parable. So I thought I never thought of that. It was so interesting, um, and they they didn't get it. He's the Messiah. So, well, so uh, thank you for that. Well, wait, wait, wait. So, thank you for that. Could you just say, so what are your thoughts about this lack of fairness? Is there a lack of fairness here? Probably. The two brothers were in dispute, and they were both there, according to the commentary I read, that they felt from the Bible that they were both there, and Jesus was answering both of them. So, um, fairness, well, I, you better answer this, Tom. <laughs> No, I... <laughs> no, this is up to each one of us. This, this is an important question, I think, because, you know, this is a, uh, a topic. The lack of fairness is a topic that repeatedly comes up throughout all of our lives, you know? Um, yeah, so what I'm is sure We all hear about it a lot, so what do we think of this, you know? Yeah, so that he, it didn't matter to Jesus. If you love God and you trust, there... Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't have something from your brother. You get it from God. I was reading um, something Matthew Henry said about if Jesus, um, if, if the um, brother had said, you know, I'm looking for the kingdom of heaven or I'm searching for a spiritual answer to this, he would have helped him. But because... His answer, I mean, his question was so, you know, just help me, help me divide this. And I don't know if we know the reason um, the brother that has the inheritance, maybe he was supposed to have it. 
and the brother that wasn't getting the inheritance, maybe he didn't deserve it. So I don't know. Just to say whether he was supposed to or not. Someone has their computer on. Please turn it down or off because we're getting an echo. So what is fair? Who's to say? Who's to make the judgment here? Can any of you ever actually say what is fair? Maybe, maybe the silence is the answer to the question. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. I don't, I don't know in this case what was fair. I, I don't. Can you ever know? I, I don't think so. Right answer. Only God knows. Yeah. People who say something is fair or not fair are playing God. And so our human justice tries to uh, be, do the best it can to resemble the justice of God. This is Eddie says that, tries the best it can. And there were, if you look it up, there are all kinds of rules and things about what, who gets the inheritance. Um, one thing I read too, which I think, I think is rather important and maybe Tom alludes to about the innumerable multitudes, but this was a very sacred and holy time. Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. And here's someone in the back who very aggressively comes forward and, and demands that he figure out his inheritance. I mean, frankly, it was very obnoxious. Oh, thank you for bringing this up. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and the other thing that he said to him was, beware of covetousness. Mary's jumping ahead again. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is a response to his question to Jesus. So, so you know, well, what do you think? I mean, all these people come to hear Jesus. This is a precious moment, and then someone asks this question. You know, will you will you uh, you know uh, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me? And you know, what do you think this guy's thinking? Well, he wasn't there to receive the message. He just wanted some selfish gain, obviously. Yes. I thought there was a sense of greed. <clears throat> he wanted to be sure that he got um, his material, um, what he felt was right. And he wasn't interested in the spiritual. That no, was all about him. It was very obnoxious. He said it very rudely. Um, and... He interrupted a very holy and sacred time, which shows he was just totally off the wall. <laughs> totally in the human mind, definitely that. But it's great. This is what I love about these parables, the way Jesus' presence of mind, the way he answers it um, so perfectly. <laughs> He's, I mean, no, he's always turning them to God, and they're over there talking about material things. Um, yes. Yeah. Goes well, back to the original. You, go which goes back to the original question: Where's your heart? Is it in selfishness, or is it humbly seeking to follow Creator? You mean, is it in a fish or a heart? Right. Are you, are you seeking what's important or, you know, quibbling about what's not so important anyway? You know, I, this, this, this made me think of one of the uh, um, revelations I got by becoming a member of the Plainfield Church. You know, I grew up in Christian science, and it always seemed like you went to church or Sunday school to learn and, you know, how to make yourself more spiritual, so to speak, you know. Um, so it was all kind of what you could get out of it. And during all those years, no one ever told me that, well, you know, there's another reason you're coming to church, you know. And then I, until I came here to the Plainfield Church, and it was like, you know, you're here to bless, um, you know, all the members of the church. You're not here just to get for yourself. Thank you. Amen, Tom. Good, good. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, let's uh, kind of focus on the brother with the inheritance. You know, I was I was thinking this morning. I was read I read about this uh, woman who's uh, selling a big ranch in Texas who has um, thirty nine billion dollars, which I think came from an inheritance. So um, she can certainly live a life of ease and relaxation. So um, why not live a life of ease and relaxation if you can? And not necessarily. I think this is the picture that we think, oh, yes, they have all this, so they're living a life of ease and relaxation. Uh, in my work, I've seen many with much money, millions, and yet as nervous, as fearful, if not more than I was. So it's not necessarily so. Well, not all it's cracked up to be. Yes, it's, exactly. It's a fault. And that's because it doesn't exist. The life of ease, that is to say ease in matter, does not exist. It's a dream. It's a deception. It's laziness. It's indifference. It's hatred. It's ingratitude. Selfish. It's all about self. And illusion. Really. It's, the, it's the Adam dream. And you really don't want to go there. Mrs. Eddy uh, says the importance of staying alert and awake. And when you get to this sense, well, you've got all this material stuff, and so I can just take my ease. You're not alert and awake. You're you're going fast asleep, and it will come caving in on you. And you know, inherited money can be sometimes the worst. We have this big area in New Jersey, this Doris Duke estate, and um, she inherited all this money, and, you know, it's a poor little rich girl story, had quite a miserable life. So, inherited money is the a, a damnation. And that's, that's why Jesus told this guy, beware of covetousness. Because it's taking you down a road that you, you it's not going to make you happy. I mean, right there, it's, it's dividing the brothers anyway. It's, it's starting a family dispute and, you know, dissension and all kinds yes. of unhappiness anyway. Yes, and we hear it so often. We saw it in our church. <laughs> Inheritance. People come around like vultures. People you haven't seen in years start flocking around, waiting for their money. It, it's a disgusting picture. That's why I go back to that beautiful movie of, um, about the lion. What was the name? Oh, Secondhand Lion. Secondhand Lion, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. A beautiful story about that. Seems like it happens all too often. Family members, presumably brothers and sisters, presumably you love each other in the same family, and the squabble yeah. over inheritance brings out the worst of hatred I've ever seen in my life. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, in one of the commentaries, it mentions two things, and I think it's important here. That is the lottery and gambling. How do they pertain to this? Exactly the same. Yeah, I was thinking of the lottery also. You know, these people that win the lottery, um, a lot of them, most of them lose it. They they. They wind up worse than where they were before because they've quit their jobs and they give money away at random and not to a good purpose. And um, it just brings them lower, in my estimation. That's been my observation. There was a family, though, I believe, in Alabama that did win the lottery, and I think that they said... They were still going to live in their mobile home. They were still going to do their jobs that they did. And I think they did say they were going to help others. So there are some people that take it and do good with it. But I believe the majority, it just takes them down a worse path. Yeah, if, if it's unearned, really, if you haven't earned it, if you haven't earned it, then you don't know what to do with it. And it's so sad, you know, and, and some of these things, they, they play towards people who don't have it in the first place. And, and my understanding is that the government makes money on these things. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, the states do, yeah. They've got right. a lot of money. 
as a form of taxation. But it's been observed around Atlantic City here, those that are actually contributing to support this whole activity are those that are have earned a pittance of money, a lot of it's Social Security or welfare benefits, and they get on a bus and go down there, and they just blow it all. It's people that have shown that they have done little as far as living responsibly. Those are the ones that are attracted to this, and they have little to start with. And and the, the, the awful thing about it is it's, it's addictive. It's addictive. It just it, it, to me it is it is some huge sin, and not just on those who participate, but those who enable that participation. Atlantic City was once a beautiful, beautiful city on our shore of New Jersey, and they brought in all this gambling. I mean, it has gone so downhill. It is something uh, not of God in any way, either one. The Atlantic City has gone way downhill, and it's a mess. It is. That's so why uh, government uh, should not allow that, and that's why it was illegal at one time. But uh, one thing that this brings to mind is that what happened to my Christian Science Society was that uh, we were offered a million dollars for our church and uh, property, and uh, when that happened, the whole thing fell apart. And you, I mean, you know, you would have thought that... Uh, being Christian scientists and being Christians, that people could handle it, and we didn't even get a penny out of it. There was no, there was an offer for a million dollars. They never put up any money, like even ten thousand dollars, be a hold, and the whole church fell apart over nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. So it goes back to the first question, doesn't it? Abundance. Yes. Abundance, having a lot of whatever it is you think you need. But be careful what you think you need. Yeah, be careful what you ask for. And if you haven't earned it, many people who haven't earned it don't know how to. They don't know how to keep it. They don't know how to keep it or use it. There's a proverb. There's a proverb that goes, a fool and his money are soon parted. <laughs> so uh, a brief story about un unearned in money is... Uh, my great-grandfather fought in the Civil War, and then um, after he did his two-year service, went to Montana. And then meanwhile, he was there, he got to know someone who was, actually became one of the richest men in America. And this guy uh, ended up getting some gigantic uh, apartment on Fifth Avenue, and he had, he had a daughter who inherited all of his money. And so she's fabulously wealthy uh, during, uh, like, the Depression times. And... Um, you know, um, what'd she do with it? She was so miserable. She actually lived in a tiny hospital room across the street from me for 20 years. She never left her room. What a miserable life. Yeah, it shows, I took care. <laughs> there's no joy in, in that. Go ahead, Vaughn. No, I said I took care of someone just like that, lived in the hospital for 10 years. He had money, a beautiful big house, and it's just it's a miserable scene to see this man. And, well, he had the nurses around the clock and all that, but still, his, his life was just uh, confined to this one room uh, the rest of his life. And I, I think it's when you think... I don't know why the echo. Yeah, turn off your computer, please. <coughs> or it could be a speakerphone. Yeah, no yeah, speakerphone. Somebody phone. have their speakerphone on. <coughs> <to> please drop. <coughs> yeah. Uh, you know, no matter how much you have, never to substitute that as your security, uh, because God is all. God alone is the security. Thank you. It brings to mind back when Mrs. Evans was teaching us, we, she said that your mentality is either a sink or a fountain. And if you are very selfishly indulged with yourself, your thinking is a sink, and it brings in it all the things that want, you want to flush down the drain. Whereas if your mentality is with God, it is a fountain. And a fountain is as pure as its source. And not only that, it's as abundant as its source. So I thought... That was a good illustration. 
Our mentality is a fountain of good because it comes from God. If it comes from God. <laughs> and this this belief that we, um, you know, do everything we can, enough money so we can live the life of ease and relaxation is really a total myth because there's no fulfillment in it, and we were created for purposeful living. We were given individual gifts and talents that are meant to be used to bless, and there's no real peace or happiness if we're not living a purposeful life. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. I looked up the definition of relaxation, and it says remission of attention or application as a relaxation of mind, study, or business. Very good. So if you're, let, you're letting your guard down, you won't be ready for when things get rough. You're yes. Relaxing your mind. Yep. That's actually the most dangerous thing that can ever happen to anybody. Whatever it is that causes you to relax your alertness, that's no good. That's danger. That's an open door for catastrophe. Yeah, we used to have a cartoon on our bulletin board of this man. He was on his, on a raft, and he was lying back, you know, head on the pillow, just enjoying the lovely day. And and what what he couldn't see, because his face was toward the other way, was he was about to go over a waterfall. And uh, <laughs> a reminder, mm -hmm. just when you're in your relaxation, you know, you'll be ready to go over a waterfall. Stay alert. Never off guard. The interesting thing on uh, going back to my society, this just brings back memories, was that one person uh, decided that uh, we needed to buy a smaller building, and uh, she wanted a room in that building so she could stay in that room. And it was just so bizarre <clears throat> what happened with everybody. So what ended up happening was that we, uh, well, not we, but the church got uh, $500,000 finally for the property. And one would think all the fantastic things we could do with $500,000, but uh, $400,000 of that went to the mother church because uh, this person appeared from Boston and uh, got in the ear of the, some of the members. So, <clears throat> The bottom line is, is that all the money in the world isn't going to make Christian science work. It's obviously the Spirit of God that makes it work. Thank you. Well, you see our, our magazine you. coming out. This is Eddie says, demonstration. That's what makes the church. Not money, nothing. Stone is demonstration. And that was not. And, and yes, the, the way the mother church, I won't call it, it's the BOD goes forward, is they make all their money off of all these little old ladies who give them all their money, and, and the churches, they come around like vultures. We thank God we have our church. They couldn't take our church, ours, why we're hanging on to it. <laughs> well, and they have no legal right to take any church. That's what they've done, is they've, they've persuaded all these branch churches to put them, the uh, board in their will so that when these branch churches close, it goes to the board of, direct, board of directors in Boston. Think about it. That's what they're living off of up there, the closing of branch churches. It's in their, it's in their favor to have them close. <laughs> the more they close, the more money they get. So it's something very wicked has taken over. It's not, has, has nothing to do with Christian science. Nothing to do. They could not have such financial irresponsibility and be a Christian scientist. It would be impossible. Okay. So, um, uh, actually, Gary, did you want to read the next question? Uh, <laughs> number four? Yeah, but somebody wants to speak first. Oh, go ahead, um, please. On this question number three, one of the things that keeps coming to mind is this whole thing about people retiring into a life of ease and relaxation and are looking forward to that as a time of ease and relaxation. 
and it's kind of like this real false, weird picture, and uh, you don't want to get into that. Yeah. Right. In a way, it's kind of signing your own death warrant, isn't it? Yeah. To desire that. Uh, I know when my grandfather retired, he was always really active before that. Then after that, after a few years, he told me, like, I feel useless and without a purpose now. He's like, I should never have retired. <laughs> Oh, true. Yes. Yeah. Because so, along with that, too, comes, you know, the the socializing or visiting doctors all the time. That becomes <laughs> part of the retirement, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, and all these retirement villages, you know, which you're surrounded with. You know, you're going to go, and then you have all this care and all, all of this, all anti-Christ. really is. Nothing to do with Right. The topic of conversation in most of them is their health. What <laughs> doctor do you go to? What kind of pills do you take? Uh, I've been retired over 20 years, and I have never been so busy in my life. <laughs> yes. I keep right on going. Good for you. But you so never retired. So none of us is ever going to retire. Yeah, none of you are. That's it. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't retire. You can't retire from life. No. Yeah. Right. That's another, that's another case of the vultures, though, the, in the form of insurance companies, doctors, and retirement mm -hmm. homes preying in on people's money. You're right. Okay, we'll right. go on now. Question number four, Tom? Yeah, please. What makes it easy to covet, or is it easy not to covet? Well, COVID has certainly seems pretty prevalent in this world, doesn't it? A lot of advertising going on for wonderful things. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really important point in this yes. discussion. Jeremy and I were talking about it yesterday, this subliminal uh, advertising that goes on. Some of it you don't even see. It's a pulsating or something. You need this. You can't have that, you know, in fashion world, the must-haves, you must have this, this fall season. You must. You have to have it. I mean, you're just going to die if you don't, or whatever. It's a anyway, must-have. It's a must-have. It's not no question. And so you get bombarded with all these must-haves, and then pretty soon then you see your neighbor who has the must-have you didn't get, and you want that must-have. That It's all animal magnetism. And what is it playing on? In that you lack something. Yeah, it's, playing on the, it's playing on your own belief uh -huh. that somehow life is material, that life is in and of matter, that some, somehow something material is going to make you happy. Playing on what you value. If you don't value something, you won't come to them. Yeah, where your treasure is, where your treasure is, and and this want, this desire for things, it's insatiable. No end to it. You get you get that must have pocketbook, and then something else comes up. Yeah, if you buy it, if you buy that whole belief, there really, there really is never enough, is there? You can never have enough. Once you believe that things make you happy, and since they don't, unless you get out of that vicious cycle, you just, you, you, you keep wanting more and more and more. You're never satisfied. You're just never satisfied. Like going around a merry-go-round and trying to reach for the ring, and you get close, but you never get close enough. Right, and that's because it's impossible to be satisfied with that. But there's no ring. It's all an illusion. Right. Your real hungering and thirsting is for God, and you've misdirected it. 
I'm going to read. There, this is precept three. This piece is earth and valuable. I, I can't read all of it. It's 195, so it's kind of 197. But it deals with this. Um, Carpenter says, in science, we not only must not seek to obtain that which we have not demonstrated, but we must not even cherish a desire for it. One who is sick should not even want to recover unless the health and harmony that comes is the result of the demonstration or thought correction that entitles him to get well. It breaks the moral precept for a student to desire what he does not deserve, and he does not deserve that which he has not demonstrated or cannot pay for. Mortals are willing to run into debt in order to buy that which they cannot afford to pay for. We have a parallel in science in those who are willing, when they are sick or get into trouble, to run to another for help, and yet are not willing to make the slightest effort to help themselves. Sickness in a student is always the evidence that he does not deserve help. Something to think about. He has permitted the thought of which health is a manifestation to be submerged or overruled. Unless one thinks enough of God to be willing to maintain a spiritual thought as far as he is able, he does not deserve help. Students should not wait until they are sick before they go to work to clean up the mental debris, which carelessness permits to accumulate in thought. And there again, that's the ease, so the lack of alertness. That means getting out of debt in the mental realm when Mrs. Eddy says, do not get in de debt, she might add, do not owe God, let him owe you. And then, the Bible warns us not to covet. What one's neighbor has in science is the manifestation of his demonstration. A similar supply will be yours when you make a similar demonstration. You break the commandment, however, when you covet since that means that you not only desire the manifestation without making the demonstration, but that you would be willing to have it and thus run into debt to God. To covet means to be willing to have God's rewards without making the effort to deserve them. Progress comes only when we desire right thinking and work for it and are willing to have the fruit of that right thinking in proportion as we earn it. It goes on. It, it, it's a wonderful few pages. It's wonderful. It explains so deeply and thoroughly this covetousness. You know, and, and people try, and I know I've been there, I've done it, even to get help, help well, through medication. And you see, when you do that, over and over and over. Your body is protesting to your wrong thinking, this mental debris that Carpenter talks about. It's protesting it. So you just overrule it. You dope it up. You just march forward with will, and eventually you're going to collapse. Or even in, in science, people who willfully try to get better just will it. And then they get so mad at this, their selves or their practitioner. Why, why aren't I better? <laughs> you know, I, I ask for help. I should be better. Mm -hmm. They don't care about the change of thinking. You have a debt to God that you haven't paid. This runs parallel to, to everything. And that's why our society that is so full of financial debt, that's so wrong. They're not willing to demonstrate, to work or earn for what they want. They'll just put it on their credit card, and eventually that collapses. Eventually, our whole economy will collapse. You cannot disobey these rules. They are paramount. These are, again, biblical rules of finance. And then, to top it off, that makes it so awful, and I know Florence has heard it, and I've heard it too, Christian scientists, well, look at that person. She's got a healing, and I don't, and I want that healing. Or even at, at a testimony meeting, well, all those healings, but I don't have any healing. It's so obnoxious, that state of thought. You don't have it, and you never will until you cut it out. So instead of looking at what do I owe God, you know, it's all about how am I not getting better. I'll 
anyway. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you some of that. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, addressing that thought about um, why am I not better, it really um, alerted to me uh, memories of a lot of the material you read coming from the BOD really almost sets that thought up, the way the parade healings before people, and rather than, it really doesn't feel like it's glorifying God. And so That's absolutely it's really, correct. Thank you. But I think the problem is that I don't give you what you need to have the healings, because this is, you know, I'm sitting here listening, thinking about how angry and and uh, offended I was, and it was mostly at myself, because I just couldn't understand. And, uh, you know, so 12 years into Christian science, and then finally, after uh, finally listening to roundtables and Bible discussions and all those little hints that I kept thinking, uh, because I never saw them any other place. I mean, just the idea of praying until you have peace, and you know that you've prayed properly. Nobody ever told me that. I mean, nobody even in the beginning told me the difference between a capital M and a small N, M on mind, for example. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, I mean, for years I couldn't find anything in prose works because I had a new book that had no tab, and I didn't even know it was a compilation of, you know, a half a dozen books. I'm looking for page 120, and what they told me on was, was on 120 wasn't there. So if people have no clue, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. I totally believed in Christian science, but I just couldn't do it because I was clueless. Yeah. So it made me angry. So and now I have more peace because now I'm getting the idea on how to do it. So thank you yeah. very much. You're welcome. And this is why we do this week after week after week after week. Not two weeks of class and then throw you out. Week after week after week. And I every time we approach this Bible study, I think, oh, my gosh, I've read this story so many times. What in the world will we have to talk about? And what God reveals is amazing. It's amazing to me. I sit at the feet of Jesus at these Bible studies and roundtables. God is feeding his sheep when we're willing. And I, it's been so long ago since I've had any connection with the organization. But it's interesting what some of you say. And I, I thank God, thank you all for your testimonies. God forbid that we get up and sound like we are superior and we've had healings and what's the matter with you. That would foster this terrible covetousness. You speak out from humility, from your blood, sweat, and tears, what you have earned. And, and because you've earned it, you want to share it with others. And that heart meets heart and that is what heals and nothing else does and nothing else is acceptable. And I appreciate those constant reminders because I need them. You know, it might sound uh, repetitious to other people, but I need to remember that I have to get up in the morning and think of God first because there's many mornings when I go. You know, I've got other things on my mind. I just so appreciate your constant reminders because that's what uh, most people need, I think. Yeah, thank you. Right. Like, we all need the reminders, we Mike. Do. We do. Absolutely. You know what Elizabeth said in her testimony Wednesday night, I mean, we talk about drugs and liquor, but there's all this other, the reality shows, the Twitters, the Facebooks, and I'm not saying everything is bad, but a lot of it, it's so time-consuming. It'll draw you so far away. If I didn't have this Bible class, I wouldn't have done all the studying and, and come up with these things that have have blessed and and those of you who are speaking and are blessing us with what you have reaped from it, it would be so easy not to. This is the discipline. This is staying in gear. This is we have to. You know, Mrs. Eddy says by the year 2100, we will either have done this work or not. And if we don't, the world will drift into another era of dark ages. Don't think it can't happen. Because without God, it's pretty dark. <laughs> 85 years is really long time. So. No, it is. <clears throat> yeah. And you know, to get back to the question, what's easier, 
easier to covet or easier not to covet? You know, it's one thing to look at your neighbor, see what he has, and wish you had it. But let's make a rule. Let's set this down as a treatment. It's just as easy or easier to get up in the morning and thank our Heavenly Father for His infinite blessings and humble yourself before Him and get into that mindset which are all the treasures are. So this idea of easy, which one is easier? Let's get down to reality. Yes. And so... Well, I guess my thought is, um, yes. But, you know, just because we're members of the Plainfield Church, do we really sort of escape this sense of covetousness? I mean, are we now um, immune to it? We're not. I'm working we on it. Have to, we don't have to worry about it because we're above all that. No. Not true. No. I don't think anybody here is making nope. that claim. Nobody no, and I think, that. I think the difficulty here is with the word easy. Anything worthwhile is not easy. Anything worthwhile requires work. Yeah. yeah. The idea of easy is there's a lot of distraction out there coming at you. And if you relax your mentality, if you make it easy, then you're a sitting target. So the answer is don't make it easy. Stay alert and keep working. Thank you. And okay. if you ever are tempted with being covet, coveting someone, instead you should thank God that they have whatever it is and, and that because it's available to them, it's available to you as well, to everyone. That is your attitude. If you don't have that attitude, you're shutting all the doors on yourself. You'd be grateful for them. And then it will that gratitude will open it up for you too. But remember, it, it's whatever it is. It's, it's something good. It was earned. And if it wasn't earned, it won't last. So you shouldn't covet it. So if you're willing to work for it, you can have it too. Anyone can. It's available to all. Come ye to the fountain. Um, so, um, I guess we're getting towards the end of the hour, but I'll cover the last couple of questions. So, um, for question five, um, to me, sort of the question two is a lead into it about this lack of fairness. Um, you know, I was um, reading on some Christian ministry site about um, uh, lessons about the, uh, the rich fool, and um, the guy wrote a story about um, some lemonade stand, and it was all about... Um, uh, want versus need, and um, talked about um, um, supply and demand, about how that's bad. And you know, uh, if if we have more than we need, then then we should be giving it to people. Anyway, it's all kind of interesting. But um, you know, I read through the whole thing. There was not one mention of God. It was on a Christian ministry site. Wow. So <laughs> not one mention. You know, that is so, always a, a bit of a red flag. And, and yeah. that's when you get into New Age, too, where they, they leave God out of the picture. And that was my thought about the fairness. You know, I, I sometimes think that uh, this parable, the rich fool, has been um, actually deliberately mis-explained to people to lead them into thinking that they need to make life fair yes. and, and not to think about God. Thank you. So right. that whenever, we didn't, no, go ahead. whenever anybody tells me what they think is fair, <laughs> it's so clear that it's what they want. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's my lead in the question five because I think that this is a lesson. I think that uh, um, you may have different thoughts on what you think the lesson is on the rich fool, but you know, um, question is what are some of the things one can could do to be rich towards God. Well, they can start out with gratitude for what they do have. I thought obedience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And being honest. <coughs> Honestly, yes, it's spiritual power. I think giving more, looking where we could be of greater service. Yes. R right thinking would God and willing to do only his will. 
that he has planned for your life. Yes, trusting his qualities daily. Yes. Hi there. The idea of joy and <laughs> being a cheerful giver. Yes. Suzanne, what did you say? Tithing. Yes. One way. Biblical rule of finance. You yep. cannot do it if you don't want to, but it's a biblical rule of finance, and please don't complain to me about your lack. <laughs> and that means tithing of your time. It does. As well. Tithe, yes, it does. And, and a lot of you do that generously. Using your talents to bless what you've been given, you give to bless. Yes. Being compassionate with others. Yes. Living the first commandment, having no other gods before me. Yes. The challenging one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Striving. Go ahead. I said striving. Striving to know more, and the more you know, the more you demonstrate. Good. Um, Joanne wrote Joanne on the floor. On the floor. How uh, Mr. Evans had told us, uh, when, whenever you're doing anything, I guess maybe this is tithing too. You you give that part of it in prayer. For instance, if you're doing something for an hour, you spend six minutes praying about it. Um, this is being rich toward God is thinking about the Father. I mean, it, when you when you do it, you begin to do it more naturally. Sometimes some of you might need to set your watch alarm to remember, but, um, but certainly if you're going to be proofing or other things, pray before you do it. Be rich toward God, thinking thinking about Him. Whatever, whatever task you're going to drive, Know that God is behind the wheel of your car and the wheel of every other car. Know that it, you know, it will be a blessing and that Christ goes before you to prepare the way. These are just natural ways to pray. If you're going to a movie, pray that the movie that you choose will be a blessing. It won't be some horrible, depressing thing that you'll take months to get out of your thought. This is being rich toward God. It reminds me. Go ahead. Mr. Evans also taught us every hour take time to pray to God, and that's a good habit to get in. Right. That's just what I, I mentioned. It uh, it reminds me a little bit of this story that Mary mentioned a couple of weeks ago about the the, the shepherd uh, dog, the sheep dog, when the shepherd who owned the dog. Uh, gain confidence that the dog would always obey every command, then the shepherd uh, trusted the dog more. And he explained that that's taught him about his relationship with God. When, when God knows that he is obedient to God. God gives him more to do. God trusts him with more to do. That is that is being rich towards God. And I, to me, the bottom line is, how obedient am I to God's will? That's the test. I'm going to um, read again, and maybe this will be a good way to end it, unless someone else wants to say anything. Um, this is Kratzer's The Law of Right Healing, this article. It's a very, very important article. And, and it's, this is a very subtle thing, um, but so listen carefully to this. He's talking about, you know, a pocketbook. Say if you lose a pocketbook. So, so you lose your pocketbook and suddenly you are devastated and upset because you've lost your pocketbook. He says, joy and peace are not properties or manifestations of a full pocketbook. 
Hence, they cannot possibly pr proceed from such a pocketbook. Isn't that true? Your joy and happiness isn't coming from this pocketbook. Joy and happiness are properties or manifestations of spirit God and proceed from him alone. The argument or seeming that there is a connection between a pocketbook and the joy and peace of the mind is one of the deceptions of false sense Satan. It's a deception. We think our happiness and everything else is dependent on a full pocketbook or a person or something else. It is not, and this goes back to obeying the first commandment. It all has to do with God. And you know very well, if you've been upset because you've lost your pocketbook, when you get your thoughts quiet and turn it to God, you will find the pocketbook. He goes on. All the misery of the human race is attributable to the fact that the human mind allows ignorance and false sense to enforce their claim that a connection exists between true feeling and material circumstance and human behavior, whereas no such connection exists. The only legitimate connection of feeling is with God. This is the truth. A part of that truth with Jesus, with which Christ Jesus declared would make those who know it free from the ills of life. If we but say to ourselves many times per day, perchance, as occasion arises, no connection, applying the phrase as a reminder that there is no necessary or really reasonable relation, no connect, connection exists between seeming material loss or unjust or unkind behavior on the part of a human being and that love, joy, and peace, which belong to us as children of God, then we will, be protecting, we will be protecting ourselves from the loss of the only riches which are real. We will live more happily, healthily, and prosperously, even in a worldly sense, and more fully obey the command, lay not up yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Doing this, we shall seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what we need to eat, drink, and wear will infallibly be added unto us notwithstanding any temporary seeming to the contrary. This is the promise of Christ, whose word cannot fail. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a subtle thing that Era would try to do to us, to make us covet and think our happiness is somewhere else, when it re it's only in God. And when we seek him first in his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. And obeying him is a joy. Just like last truth. Should be the greatest joy of our lives. And that makes it easy not to come. It makes it very easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tom, that was a wonderful class. Those were just fantastic questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Call recording off. This call is being recorded. Call recording off. This call is being recorded.